Good morning for our viewers on the West Coast and good afternoon for those of us in the East. I'm Tracy Woods, Vice President of Operations for the American Association of Blacks in Energy. And I want to welcome you to our February edition of our monthly Abe webinar. Our topic today is transportation policy, climate change and equity, the future of transportation. Our theme for this year has been connecting the dots. And our hope is that this afternoon, this morning, we will help connect the dots uh, in those areas that I just mentioned. Uh, this panel will examine transportation as a major climate change contributor. Uh, the purpose of the US policies incentivizing alternative fuel vehicles transportation infrastructure challenges, and the policy concepts supporting transportation equity. Our moderator today is none other than Dr. Deidre Sanders, who has an extensive background in environmental justice. She spent years working in this area for the Pacific Gas and Electric Utility, and now leads Arc Spring Consulting, helping businesses, nonprofits, and public agencies walk the talk. Deidre, please introduce your panelists, and we look forward to what we know will be an engaging conversation. Well, thank you, Tracy, and uh, it's my pleasure to represent Abe and, and moderate this panel on, on a topic that's of, of great interest to many in our community and, and in our industry. Um, first, I have to do a little bit of a housekeeping disclaimer. Um, while I know this topic has created a lot of buzz, a little buzz I didn't expect is for my landscaper to show up outside while I'm moderating this panel. So there might be a, a little bit of extra noise and I may mute myself um, during others' conversation and will do my best to keep out that background noise. So I just want to uh, apologize ahead of time uh, for that uh, unexpected uh, background, but many of you know how it is working from home right now. Um, that, that said, let's, let's get on to the topic at hand. Um, my three uh, uh, panelists, uh, excellent panelists to help us with this conversation uh, include uh, Kellen Schefter, uh, Director of uh, Electric Transportation at the Edison Electric Institute. Uh, Regan, uh, Regan F. Patterson. Uh, Dr. Patterson is the Transportation Equity Research Fellow at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and uh, Allison Cunningham, Director of Federal Affairs at the National Ga Natural Gas Vehicle Association of America. And welcome to all three of you. Um, we are, um, how, how, this is an ex extremely um, perfect time, pardon my grammatical, disconnect um, for this conversation, given the new administration, given the transformation of the electricity sector overall and the role of electric vehicles, all of this coming together to address uh, or driven by the urgency of climate change. And if you don't believe it, if, you, if you're still a skeptic, I suggest you look at what's happening in Texas right now in terms of weather and weather effects and um, what's been happening for the last several years here in California in terms of the intensity of wildfires, um, flooding, um, uh, hurricane intensity, uh, all of these effects that we are seeing of uh, climate change. And part of this effect is affecting our grid and affecting how we deliver energy um, some assumptions that we made in terms of uh, disaggregating the grid and in terms of uh, market uh, delivery, um, applying um, real time or right now uh, delivery of electricity, um, just like we would do with uh, groceries or, or, or goods and other retail goods and assumptions about how that would work are being uh, challenged in terms of how it's actually playing out uh, in terms of price stability and grid reliability. But this also uh, bringing this to electric uh, transportation and, um, and the grid, I, I want to tee up a provocative question for you. Is this about 
transportation electrification or is it about transportation uh, decarbonization? And the reason I ask is because the conversation is very focused on electrification when the goal of climate change reduction is decarbonization. And if we talk about decarbonization, the conversation becomes much broader. But if we talk about electrification, the conversation is very narrow and very specific. This has implications for the Black community and other communities of color because communities tend to be in areas with older infrastructure that is more expensive, uh, built out environment oftentimes, or if they're more rural communities, um, it, just a lack of investment in, in our communities and in counties uh, that are predominantly uh, uh, poor communities of color, uh, African-American communities or Latino communities uh, that are the more historic rural communities. What this means is that we are told, oh, we'll just electrify the new construction. We will do, because that's much more cost effective. But what does this mean for older communities where it's more expensive to upgrade the infrastructure where is that money coming from? And the, oh, we'll get to it later discussion that we've heard in previous generations of investment in our communities, we've had a history of later doesn't happen for us and we're left behind. So here's the nut. Economic efficiency may not mean equity. And a lot of our arguments about why we're doing things and how we do them is about, oh, well, this is economically efficient. But if equity is more expensive to achieve, is that what we should be talking about and not about everything's about cost? Because our regulatory structure is set up to be about cost and not to be about equity. So with that as the um, context for this conversation, I, I really want to give our panelists the opportunity to give an opening statement about um, where their uh, industry perspective sees transportation equity happening, how it sees it happening in their piece of the, uh, uh, of the conversation. And then we're going to try to pull this all together and talk about implications for how we all arrive at this future transportation paradigm shift, whatever you want to call it, um, with all of us benefiting. Um, we will start with um, Let's start with Kellen, and then we'll go to Allison, and then to to Reagan, um, and take about uh, two or three minutes to to um, tee up uh, your perspective. Kellen, great. Well, thank you so much, and it's it's an honor to be here, and thank you for having EEI's uh, perspective on the panel. Um, if you're not familiar with EEI, we are Edison Electric Institute. We are the trade association for the investor-owned electric companies in the U.S. Um, so certainly we come from the perspective of, of uh, electrifying transportation, connecting transportation to the electric power system. Um, and we see that as a benefit for a couple of reasons. One, um, our members particularly, but the electric power sector generally has been doing a really commendable job of reducing emissions from electric generation um, over the past decades. But really since 2005, our members emissions are down about 45% we're on track to have an 8% CO2 reduction by, by 2050. That, that's a major, um, you know, major progress, particularly in comparison to the transportation sector when you look at you know, emitting sectors in the US, which has been relatively flat over that time. So we really see a huge benefit in taking advantage of the emissions reductions that are already happening on the energy grid, connecting that to transportation sources, um, and really leveraging the, the benefits that are already being made on, on the power sector side. 
Um, and of course, on the vehicle front, that means zero emissions at the point source, right? So removing the, the tailpipes really has major impacts uh, on air quality. So we see that as a, a, a major uh, thrust of what we're, you know, what we're excited about when it comes to transportation. Um, but I think picking up sort of the theme of the panel here, um, we do know when there's an, an energy transition like this to a new technology, there's of course uh, a risk that communities will be left behind and we need to do what we can to ensure an equitable transition. Um, and you know, a couple of things I'll point out there, um, you know, electric company action in this space. So looking at our member companies and their investments that they're making to support electric transportation is actually a great way to achieve outcomes that can serve uh, communities of color, particularly black communities. Um, we have an ab obligation to serve all customers. I think that's an important key factor to keep in mind about electric companies. Um, infrastructure is one of the key barriers to uh, electrifying transportation. We see a huge role in that space. And because we are regulated companies and because there are policy levers that, that guide what our companies do, these investments can be targeted, can be focused to achieve these policy outcomes. Um, so I'm happy to talk more at length about how we've been putting that in practice and talking about those, um, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, but I'll just leave it there and share that sort of opening perspective and happy to get into more conversation. So thanks for having me. All right, thank you, Kellen. Um, Allison. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me here today. I know this is a very well regarded group and I'm very appreciative of your time and the ability to speak with you all directly today. My name is Allison Cunningham. I'm the Director of Federal Government Affairs for a group called NGV America. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are the national trade working for a growing, profitable, and sustainable market for natural gas. That's compressed natural gas, liquefied natural gas, and increasingly renewable natural gas in transportation applications specifically. NGVs have a really interesting and unique story. I think that they're a hidden secret in many ways, because unlike vehicles at the light duty level, you don't really think about, you know, maybe the trash truck that comes to your house. You don't get to have a say in what kind of trucks Amazon uses to deliver your packages to your house, but there are a lot of environmental and economic implications there. Uh, one thing that's unique about NGV America is our member base. We have about 200 members across the country, everything from local distribution companies like the utilities, the gas counterparts to Kellen's members. We also have a lot of fleet members, uh, waste management, the nation's largest fleet, UPS and others. So we talk a lot about the vehicle side and getting trucks changed out to cleaner vehicles and things along those lines, particularly in areas where you have industrial areas or high traffic areas or neglected inner city areas or neglected communities. The nice thing about natural gas is that it only produces trace amounts of particulate matter or 99% less than diesel, which is still the majority of what's on the road today. Uh, NOx emissions are near zero. They're 90% less than the EPA limits. And so they're really 90% cleaner than that current NOx standard, which we hope will be a cleaner standard in the future that will come along as well because we are really as, even though we lobby for natural gas, in some ways we're technology neutral because we realize that there are different needs in different communities and different applications that are going to have different uses that work the best. So when it comes to federal policy, we just want to say, have a standard, let a technology meet that standard, and we can go from there. Um, if you're using regular natural gas, it emits 21% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than comparable gas and diesel vehicles. And when fueling with renewable natural gas, which is naturally occurring biomethane that's captured above ground, cleaned up and used in vehicles, the greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced by up to 382%. So it's a really unique story. The affordability of natural gas certainly allows a variety of different communities to deploy more clean vehicles. And they, it allows transit agencies as well to continue to invest in cleaner vehicles while not having to take you know, money away from expanding their routes or reducing their service or raising their fares. So there's a lot of exciting developments going on in natural gas, and I'm excited to have the panel and to have a discussion about it in ways that we can all work together towards shared goals. Thank you, Allison. And uh, Reagan, um, your, your contribution. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on this panel of experts. 
Um, my name is Dr. Reagan Patterson, and I am the Transportation Equity Research Fellow at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And I'd like to use this time I have for interactive comments to reflect on the human consequences of the current transportation and energy model. As Dr. Sanders mentioned, climate change is happening and the impacts are being felt now. Not in 50 years, 10 years, or even five years, but now. And we see this today <clears throat> as millions of people experience blackouts across 14 states due to extreme cold weather. The controlled blackouts are in response to frozen infrastructure and the energy grid being strained with marginalized communities being among the first and facing the longest outages. The energy infrastructure was not built to withstand extreme weather, which will become more frequent because of climate change. The human consequence is people without power, heat, refrigerated food, clean and running water, and internet. This particularly impacts the vulnerable and disenfranchised, including people of color, low income, sick, elderly, differently abled, unhoused, and incarcerated. And these impacts, along with rising energy prices, are on top of those already being experienced because of COVID-19, among which are unemployment and financial crises. And this is not just a story of ice. Also, as Dr. Sanders mentioned, it is also a story of fire. In California, utilities have adopted a policy of rolling blackouts during fire season to reduce risk of wildfires, a fire season that is now longer and with increased intensity. I mean, who heard of a fire NATO before last year? And again, this results in human consequences. Energy infrastructure must be prepared for extreme weather, weather, which will become more frequent, as well as for increased demand. Increased demand due to these extreme weather events and also increased demand from the electrification of the transportation sector, which is partly motivated by the transportation sector's contribution to climate change. According to the US EPA, transportation accounts for the largest portion of greenhouse gas emissions in the US, 28%. There is an urgent need to build what the Biden administration calls a, quote, modern sustainable infrastructure and an equitable clean energy future, and to also ensure that Black folks are equitably represented in those infrastructure and clean energy jobs. Now, up until now, I focused on climate change. It would be remiss of me not to also mention transportation in relation to health risks. I will start by acknowledging that it is Black History Month and it is also Black Futures Month, which was created by the Movement for Black Lives to quote, both consider and celebrate Black radical history and to dream and imagine a world in which we are free and self-determined. While I received academic training in both chemical and environments engineering, I came to truly understand the human consequence of transportation related policies and practices through the work, well, particularly the work of Black women environmental justice organizers fighting for and reimagining a world conducive to livable Black futures. This includes women like the late Ms. Marie Harrison of Green Action for Health and Environmental Justice, Ms. Margaret Gordon, the co-director of West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, Dr. Bob, Dr. Beverly Wright, the director of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, and Jackie Patterson, director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. These activists and researchers help humanize data and statistics on inequitable exposures to air pollution from energy and transportation. Data like that in the NAACP's fumes across the fence line, which states that over 1 million African Americans live in areas where toxic air pollution from natural gas facilities is so high that the cancer risk due to this industry alone exceeds EPA's level of concern. And over 1 million African Americans live within a half mile of an oil and gas facility, which is a cause for concern about, human imp about health impacts from toxic air pollution, especially a concern today as facilities shut down due to freezing weather. Furthermore, let's look downstream. As my policy brief details, 24% of African Americans live near highly trafficked roads. Due to discriminatory race-based planning, Black folks are more likely to live and attend school near major roadways than whites, which contributes to racial disparities and exposure to traffic-related air pollution, and consequently, disparate health impacts, such as racial and ethnic disparities in asthma and cancer risks. So ensuring environmental justice and livable Black futures necessitates a transition from fossil fuels to carbon-free energy sources. I do also recognize that survival also depends on a check, and this is a panel for the American Association of Blacks and Energy. So I must note the need for a just transition. Calls for a clean energy economy, including that articulated by the current administration, must be met with equitable access to jobs and contracts for Black folks, for those currently employed in the energy sector, as well as those adversely impacted by the fossil fuel industry. So as a fellow at CBCF, I think about transportation equity comprehensively and try to develop a holistic vision that addresses mobility, health, and employment and affirms Black life. Thank you. 
thank you. And thank you to all of uh, all of the panelists for your opening comments. Um, I'm going to start the questions with uh, with uh, Dr. Dr. Patterson. Um, let's go back to what you just said about uh, just transition um, and uh, tying that also into a disparate health impacts of more uh, of emissions from fossil fuel uh, combustion. Um, at what point do we, uh, you heard my statement about um, anecdotal information about um, a disproportionate percentage of gas workers uh, being uh, people of color, specifically African-American, and what just transition could mean and look like. I also want to put that in the con context of the, uh, um, the perfect being the enemy of the good. So as we talk about electrification, as we talk about uh, sector transformation, and that emissions from diesel, um, mainly heavy duty uh, uh, vehicles, make up a vast majority of the, of the toxic emissions. Um, wouldn't natural gas vehicles that can be deployed right now um, for for buses and for trash trucks and other things that come through our communities that would have an immediate health benefit. Where where should we be on that right now? Instead of waiting for the perfect of an electric heavy duty vehicle to come through, and and forfeiting the health benefits today. That's sort of where my my question is. For what? Sh how should we? navigate this. Yes, and so your question alone gets to the complexity of this, where it's both an employment question around, again, um, Black people being overrepresented in, in one sector versus another. It's also a question about exposures in terms of Black livelihood. Um, and so the good uh, and the now and the time scale, well, for me and my perspective, it is anything, it's about making sure that we do things that benefit Black communities. And so if we see that zero emissions are necessary in order to really benefit Black communities, then what can we do now? Is it And is it necessarily that we must switch to natural gas or can we do other things that we can do now? For instance, the electric buses are here now. And so we know that um, Black communities are disproportionately cited um, the site of bus depots, for instance. And so is that something we can do now? We can electrify buses now. Um, what else can we do now? We can electrify other um, parts of the infrastructure, including public transit. We can begin to do that now. Um, and so I, and in terms of um, trucks, uh, because my work during graduate school did focus a lot on goods movement corridors. Um, and so, uh, and one of my studies actually looked at, we need zero emissions now because even if you do do certain technologies because of the inequitable land use planning, um, unless it is zero emission, you will always continue to have inequities and exposure. And so really it is about getting to zero emission. And so again, what can we do now? Um, and so uh, um, they are piloting programs around electric uh, diesel trucks and so, it, for, in my, I am of the opinion that we should really focus on the zero emission now and getting there now instead of these kind of intermediate steps when that technology is rapidly advancing and planning for communities today in order to have that zero emission technology introduced into our communities rather than say, well, this is something that'll help you benefit now. Well, really, when it comes to the health and well-being of Black communities, we again, I don't think can really say, oh, this intermediate step, it should be how can we introduce zero emissions and target it specifically in the introduction to vulnerable communities, specifically Black communities? All right, thank you, Dr. Patterson. And I know, Allison, that you, you're gonna want to, to have a, a, a contribution to this, but I'm gonna skip first to, to Kellen and talk about, uh, given what Dr. Patterson has said, um, we are also seen that the grid is not prepared for this and that some of these transportation vehicles are not prepared. For example, if we're talking about electric buses, while well, we have them now, 
There is also the whole question of a fleet that, uh, let's say a bus has a route and it only has so much charge, it's got to go back and forth. It's not something that you can just uh, tank up. It's got to have a charge time and recovery time. And so how is the grid going to be prepared to recharge and relaunch that vehicle uh, so that it can fulfill its purpose? Um, I'm speaking of the, of the, of the uh, structural disconnects that we have right now. Yeah, it's a great question, and thank you for that. So, I mean, you're absolutely right, Reagan. As you mentioned, transit is one of the, the fast-growing opportunities for electric transit or electric transportation in general. Um, and a lot of that is policy-driven, to be fair, right? In, in California, there's a, a innovative clean, clean transit rule that is going to require all transit agencies in the state move to zero emission buses by 2040, meaning the vehicles on the fleet, meaning in 2029, they need to be purchasing only zero emission vehicles. So they only have another buying cycle really for these 10 year plus assets, right? To get to 100% zero emission new purchases. And in California, that predominantly means electric or fuel cell. Um, and renewable natural gas may, may play a role and I'll let Allison talk more about that. Um, but it really means there isn't a lot of time to kind of figure this out, right? But to your point, Deidre, the, the, the good part about that policy is it's requiring these trans agencies to submit plans saying, here is our buying plan between 2029 and 2040. And that gives the grid time to, to prepare to your point, right? A lot of these bus depots that are being served today um, with, with diesel fuel or natural gas or whatever it is, they have a very small electric load, right? Maybe they have some lighting, some, some HVAC for the bus depot building, but they do not have sufficient capacity today to serve hundreds, two hundreds of, of buses charging at the same time, right? But the good news is the grid can expand to accommodate that need. It's really just a question of timing and cost, right? But if we have a 2029 through 2040 runway to plan and prepare for that, um, our members can help you know, meet that need. And that's really, I think, the, the critical thing here is making sure we have the visibility into where this load will be so we can plan for it and phase it out appropriately. So I think Transit is a great example for how this can work, um, you know, particularly with that, those policy drivers in place, requiring those plans submitted long-term and the grid will, will grow to accommodate that need. All right, thank you, Kellen. And, and Allison, so what is, given, given that, that Dr. Patterson has says, no, nah, we need zero emission electrification right now. And Kellen says, we're gonna build that infrastructure to get there. We don't, we don't need to, to worry about this transition stuff transportation planners are gonna take care of it. And natural gas says, hey, we got a role here too, and it is. Yeah, it's something that we can do right now. I think that I look a lot at what heavy duty trucks look like and what the makeup of the national fleet is. I think it was as recent as two or three years ago that 67% of heavy duty trucks on road didn't meet the 2010 EPA standard. And if we're looking at over the next 10 years, how long would it take to get the rest of the truck market to meet even that older standard, not even accounting for the current climate emergency we're aware of now. So that's something I think a lot about. And frankly, we have to be honest about what technology is available now. The heaviest polluting vehicles are those heavy duty trucks. We don't have heavy duty electric trucks available right now. There are a couple of pilot projects for them. There are places who have you know, trucks on order, but they're not here just yet. But I think that more importantly, we have to think about how long will it take for that to be of scale? You know, I mean, natural gas, frankly, we are have our pants beat off by countries around the world who have way more natural gas vehicles deployed because they made substantial investments and they're seeing benefit from that. So it's not like natural gas vehicles even have a huge market we're defending. It's still really diesel, you know, where you still have a lot of those particulate emissions, where they have a really big impact on asthma rates, you know, which we of course know impacts black community disproportionately. So I think that it's important in my mind, at least to think about that. And one thing that I think a lot about in my life is, you know, if you have independent owner operators of trucks, people who just own that truck and they work at a port, you know, they can't take advantage of programs like the diesel, diesel emission reduction act, where you get 30 or 40% of a new truck paid for, 
that truck is that person's livelihood. They can't afford to, you know, just get a little bit of money from the government and turn that truck over. And so we have member companies, particularly down in Houston, who are engaging in programs to say, let's help clean these now. Um, I think the other good news, though, for right now is the renewable natural gas that's really being deployed. Actually, LAMTA just converted all their buses to renewable natural gas, and they're in the process of that. They just engaged in a um, contract with a member company of ours, and New York Metro also is invested in renewable natural gas. Certainly would expect those cities and their transit authorities to be leaders in electrification as well, as I'm sure they will be on the front cusp of that. Um, but we hear from folks who are trying to balance needs of investing in those vehicles while not raising rates and trying to balance issues that they're dealing with from the pandemic, frankly, and just kind of limitations to what they can use government money for. So with that, and with one of the big federal policies that I lobby for, the alternative fuels tax credit, that's really unique because non-taxable entities can get money back. So a school district or a transit authority can get money back that they can use however they want, whether it's you know books for schools or keeping riders low or expanding routes. So that's something that's really unique and natural gas has been, you know, the tax credit with help from the government has really enabled that to be a good viable business option for transit agencies who are usually cash strapped. All right, and, and thank you. Um, th this is a great discussion. I'm going to, to make an observation that, so let's say that the, um, and I don't know this, if you do, please chime in, but I'm just gonna put up a straw argument. Let's say that the life cycle of a heavy duty vehicle or a bus is 10 years. And given what Kellen has said about uh, 2040 being the jump off point of electrification say in California, um, you can turn over that vehicle twice in, in this planning cycle and have the cleaner air if it's say a natural gas heavy duty vehicle or bus and still be prepared for electrification and still have the health benefit that Dr. Patterson referred to earlier. If not, then we waiting again for that perfect time and not having a transition uh, vehicle and not having the immediate health benefits um, while we're trying to sort out the grid modernization um, at a time. Here's another complication. At a time when we're talking about disaggregating the grid, when we have in California the rise of um, community choice aggregators that are buying power on behalf of smaller uh, uh, entities, usually at the local government level, either city or, or county level, and have their own plans for electrification and, and transportation uh, decarbonization. All of these complicating factors matter in terms of the delivery at the community level. And so how are our communities going to be engaged in this planning, because right now we're talking at this very high level systems planning um, discussion. But ultimately, uh, what many of our communities are saying is, it's our lives, they're our communities. We need to be center of these conversations, of these policy decisions. So back to you, Dr. Patterson, how do we engage our communities, but still do that in a way, and I say this because different communities want to engage differently based on, on what works for them and, and their uh, cultural cycles, dynamics, norms. But we also are doing all of this in the context of this huge policy uh, paradigm shift that has statutory timelines to get decisions made and to make investments. So I'm putting it all on you to tell us how are we going to do this? Oh, another complex question. Um, and so as I mentioned in my, my opening remarks, I mentioned self-determined is something that, um, that folks are looking for. And so what does that mean when we talk about transportation and when we talk about planning? And so, as you said, different communities want different types and levels of engagement. However, it's about community voice and also this sense of community ownership in this work. What do communities want? We often in the transportation have debates amongst ourselves around, oh, should we prioritize 
single occupancy electric vehicles in this conversation or should we be prioritizing conversations around public transportation? And so I might have my perspective, we all might have our perspective, but what does the community want and what would best serve the community in that? And so then how do we prepare transportation systems to meet that? Um, and so I'm so glad that we're having with Kellen and Allison this conversation around heavy duty vehicles, around public transit, around these different, these different types of transit within the transportation system, because these are all conversations that need to be had with community as well as with, um, as Allison pointed out, those who have are operating trucks and things like that, and talking about these loopholes through these policies, such as the deregulation of the transportation sector? How do we close these loopholes to ensure that it is not independent contractors who shoulder the burden as we transition to some of these cleaner fleets? How do we make sure we close that um, and make sure they are full employees with full benefits? Um, and so all of this needs to be part of the conversation. So it's also important, how do we define community? Community is the people who are impacted and for black communities, it's disproportionately adversely impacted. Communities also workers both in energy, both in transportation, also in, um, in trucking. And so making sure that all of these voices are at the table and leading these conversations and how do we get planners at these meeting tables? How do we get housing at these meeting tables? Um, and so, and again, going back to that idea of self-determine, Bernice King recently tweeted, we need to change who owns and controls the table. So again, not just pulling up a chair to this table, but making sure that what we're doing is in service to the communities who we purport to serve. Um, and so again, so I'm of the opinion and kind of on the side of what does community want? We can say, oh, we're gonna expand this type of electric infrastructure, but what type of electric infrastructure? Single occupancy, as you mentioned, we haven't even upgraded homes in black communities to have electric infrastructure. So it's, it's what are we doing and who is it serving and whose voice is represented in those conversations. So I think the first thing is going to community say, what do you even want? We know we need this. You have been advocating for this because of the health consequences. And so what can we do to meet your need? And so it's starting there. And from there, we have the technology to build and plan communities that really redress the inequities of the current transportation model. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. That is uh, um, the, the broadcast, two words, broadcast of, of what, what we need. Um, Allison, how is the Natural Gas uh, Vehicle Association in that industry uh, engaging uh, stakeholders at the community level uh, regarding um, the use of natural gas vehicles to address community needs, part one, how, and number two, how's that going? So I'd say that a lot of what we do is we have businesses who are really engaged in part of their local communities. And I think that's an important component of their business because they know the value of the trucks that drive through your neighborhoods. We have people who care a lot about that and the air quality that they're contributing because it's places where they live. Uh, on a more formal basis, we work a lot with clean cities coalitions, the groups that are across the country that have more local leaders who are speaking up and weighing in as far as what they want their transportation to look like, how they can clean things up. Um, but I would say, you know, I think we have more work to do. Obviously, I think that because of the rather niche area where natural gas for transportation is now, it's been largely growing in the three T's, uh, trash, trucks, and transit, uh, you know, transit is a lot more community-based, you know, and we do hear from people a lot on, okay, we need to keep affordability. You know, we need to be able to keep our routes expanded. You know, I get asked about the tax credit a lot because that's real money to transit agencies who don't get it from the federal government unless it has strings attached. Um, so I think that those are the basis of our kind of community conversations, but I'm hopeful that as an industry, we will do more. And I think that we have people who are becoming more aware of the need to engage more directly and to, as you said, create tables where maybe we aren't directing the conversation, where we're the people who are listening. And that's certainly something that I'm encouraging us to do a lot more of in a much more thoughtful way, rather than saying, hi, communities we haven't dealt with before, we have a solution for you. Let's see what they want from us. And so that's something that I'm encouraging in conversations that we have with our board of directors and business leaders, et cetera. Excellent. I, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. So how is the uh, industry 
Um, how are your businesses um, staffing and partnering in any examples that, that you can give for how they're staffing and partnering to, to make this effective, to, to um, walk that talk. And, and, um, and I say this because I, I see this as a target rich environment for mm -hmm. some of your members because a lot of transportation hubs and depots are in black and brown communities. They are, they are these freeway adjacent communities where there's this lot next door that they're, they're parking and storing their vehicles. And then they, if it's diesel, they're gonna come and fire them up in the morning. And then, you know, you've got an emissions problem from, from idling uh, vehicles. Right. And so in terms of a right now solution or a right now, um, uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just putting that out there to say that that I, I, I see this space. I don't know if your uh, members are in it. Yeah, probably my favorite example of a member of ours that's kind of engaged in this is a group called American Natural Gas. They own stations across the country. They partnered with an organization called Hoop Bus that went across the country last year. And not only did they raise awareness for the Black Lives Matter movement during the protests of last summer, they also repaired basketball courts that were in disrepair across the country. Uh, American Natural Gas fueled that bus with natural gas and has a basketball hoop on the front. So they were able to go into those communities where they were able to raise awareness of the issues that were going on, but also raise awareness that there are air quality issues here. You know, these are conversations we need to be having as we're having these larger conversations. So I think that's kind of the best and most visible example of that, where they're literally saying, you know, we need to make sure that people can breathe in a lot of different ways. Wow. Um, I have to tell you that my reaction to that was rather visceral. Um, mm -hmm. I, I get the point of, of them tying in their, um, their goal of increasing their visibility and education and awareness in the black community. Um, but as a black person that that went through, uh, not went through, but you know, emotionally with all the rest of us in the country, in particular our community, yeah. that went through the George Floyd, um, and are still dealing with that specific incident and all of the others, I I just want to caution that tying an industry objective to the trauma and pain of a community is a very dangerous thing. I, I just wanna say that as a caution and as an aid partner with, with your industry that I very that, much understand and appreciate that. And I feel like that's another conversation that I have encouraged many different people. Please do. Yeah, Please do. I, and, that, and, I, and I don't want to mischaracterize what they did because I think it was about them focusing other people, not them focusing themselves. I think that they were partners with these people who had this plan to go across the country and to give people who were meeting at these marches a place where they could play basketball and congregate and meet as a community of people who were doing and processing those painful emotions. And I don't want to mischaracterize what they did by them coming forward and saying, your problem with this is you need fuel. We'll fuel you across the country and we'll enable you guys to do this because they wouldn't have been able to do certain things without the fuel. And I think that that's where they worked with the, the people who had begun the effort to determine the messaging and the way it was carried out. But your point, I completely agree with, feel very deeply and strongly and don't think that at any point it's appropriate for the messages of last summer and the messages that are continuing to occur in this country should be used for marketing. So I don't want to have anything be unclear about my position on that or our position. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to say, uh, let's yeah, no, no, no. fair enough. Fair. Yeah. Careful. Careful. Yeah. There. Um, okay. Um, so that said, want to, to give uh, Kellen an opportunity to weigh in on community engagement uh, of EEI. I'm particularly interested in EEI's positioning on um, the disaggregation of the grid, what we're seeing at, coming back to Texas and 
real-time marketing, everything being about cost? Are we losing reliability in there? And what does that reliable, creating equity, not just across the system, but also for transportation interface with the electric system? Um, investment in communities that are have already been disinvested or whose investment hasn't kept up in terms of system upgrades. How, how are your members engaging in a real way in terms of delivering on equity? You know, it's, it's a great question. I think the what we're seeing now in, in Texas and broader the, the middle of the country just is illustrating how important I think the grid is, how complex it is, and how many factors the operators and, and owners of the grid, which are our, our members, need to take into account here, right? Affordability is key. And like you mentioned, cost efficiency is key, but reliability is key. And we're having really interesting conversations now around what kind of natural events do we need to guarantee reliability for, right? That's changing and it's evolving. Um, but I think equity is, is key as well. And so I think shifting more particularly to the, the transportation programs that some of our members are implementing it's a really important point. And I think the good news is this has been an evolving discussion that I think is moving toward uh, stronger investments with equity in mind. And so a few examples for how this is really playing out. Um, a, a recent program in, in Southern California Edison uh, called Charge Ready 2, 50% um, of the investment in the make ready infrastructure. So the the not the charging station itself, but the the trenching and the conduit and the panel upgrades, all the utility infrastructure up to where that charging station is gonna be. 50% of those, those make ready installations need to be in disadvantaged communities. So for California, they use a CalScreen tool that takes into account you know, uh, emissions exposure and also socioeconomic factors. So there's a whole complicated tool that California uses, but they arrive at this at a disadvantaged community definition and 50% of that investment in that program needs to go to those communities. And because it includes that grid infrastructure side upgrade, the existing infrastructure readiness, if you will, isn't going to be a factor here because it needs to go there and it needs to include that investment up to where that charging station needs to be. Um, so that's one example, but we've seen other ways of doing this in Excel and energy in Colorado, another large program there, transportation electrification plan was just included. Instead of saying that the number of ports that need to go into disadvantaged communities, they have a different definition, income qualified, um, emissions uh, burdened communities, um, they have a, a, an investment floor. So at least 15% of the investment of the dollars needs to go into those communities. Um, and so these are, you know, there's lots of ways you can kind of allocate funds or, or distribute funds or how you want to define it. But I, I think the good news is that we are seeing these kind of programs being included more and more, I think to the credit of, of lots of stakeholders who have been advocating for this, frankly. Um, and, and two, I want to point out Terry Travis with EV Noir, Dr. Shelley Francis with EV Hybrid Noir, they've been having really effective conversations, I would say, at the national level, kind of like, you know, venues like we're having here, EEI, the national uh, utility organizations, national EV charging companies around what are these models supposed to look like? How can we ensure these investments are getting to where they need to go? And that is actually manifesting in local utility led program designs that are happening across the country. So the, I would say there's two ways of engaging. There are these national discussions like we're having that are super important. And I would encourage you to reach out to Terry or Dr. Shelley Francis if, if you're interested in engaging at that level. But there's also all these regulatory commissions going across the country every day that are deciding how these funds will be allocated, um, what the guardrails should be, what the objectives should be. And if anyone wants to engage in that process, please reach out to me or my colleague uh, Kwame at EEI. We're happy to engage you in some of these local groups that are really helping to shape how these investments play out. All right, that that's that's helpful. I would I would make the observation that um, in uh, one of the impediments that we've seen in terms of of getting to those investments are where the incentives and the timing are. So if it is a um, a, um, a program that uh, you know you will get some incentives if you you file, but you have so much time to build it, but the infrastructure investment hasn't happened, then you've met, you've missed the window for the funding to pay for that, that installation. And so these are, these are systemic things that, that we kind of need to work out that the intent is there, but the implementation uh, uh, 
structure isn't isn't keeping isn't keeping pace. Um, we've got about five minutes or so left to our session. I would like to uh, open it up to any questions that that we have at this point to take a few. Um, and uh, I, before we get to the questions, I do want to thank uh, all three of you for for a great discussion. Um, I. While we haven't actually solved the problems in in like 50 minutes of, 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 of conversation, I think we've we've raised them and uh, definitely demonstrated the complexity of the of the issue, which means we're going to have full employment on this issue for quite a while. So um, from from being a little flippant about that, but uh, um, we, we've got a, a lot to work on. Um, all of us to ensure that the transition is equitable and effective in terms of reducing um, climate emissions and, and local pollution um, impacts on, on Black communities. Um, Tracy, do we have any questions um, from, um, from our, our audience? And let me see. Um, okay. Um, we have one question so far. It's about uh, introducing renewable natural gas into pipelines with other natural gas. Um, it was for Kellen, but I think it was really for Allison. So, so I'm going to give it to Allison. Uh, um, Sorry, Kellen. I'm not going to ask you to to to, uh, to, for the best. Like to, do this, <laughs> to to leave your lane. To leave your lane, that could be dangerous for you. Um, but uh, but Allison, uh, introducing a renewable natural gas into pipelines with other natural gas. I'm not sure what the what the um, so what of is of that question. But let's presume it is. Um, is it cost effective? Is it safe for the system? Um, what percentage? of renewable natural gas is, you know, optimal, do we know? Um, so I'll just put those possibilities out there for you. Sure, just a brief kind of explainer on it. With renewable natural gas, you capture it somewhere. A good example of use in cities and communities is capturing wastewater or ag waste or landfill waste. And so you clean that up and make it to pipeline quality natural gas and you put it into the natural gas system and it's completely interchangeable with geologic natural gas. So you have that there and that's a really easy kind of one for one transition. It can go everywhere and in existing infrastructure, which is good because it saves on costs and things like that. And I think another fuel that we don't know enough about yet maybe for the future would also be hydrogen. You know, that's another issue that could be coming along that could be another complementary fuel for heavy duty trucks in the future which could also take advantage of the existing natural gas infrastructure to your point about infrastructure investments in different places. Uh, so as far as renewable natural gas goes in transportation, it's growing very rapidly. In 2019, I think is the year we have the most recent data, 39% of natural gas used on road was renewable natural gas. Mm -hmm. And places like clean energy fuels are gonna be selling 100, they're the nation's biggest provider of uh, natural gas and transportation. They're moving all of California to renewables and they'll be doing that in the next couple of years. And those big transit contracts they have are all for RNG. So it's great, you know, it's part of the renewable fuels market. So you can get uh, RENS credits for that and make it really a, a good financial opportunity as well. And I think what we're gonna eventually see is more renewable natural gas for things like home heating and other applications. Once they can figure out how to make that, I think more affordable. There are certainly cost barriers for uh, capturing the gas, you know, the low hanging fruit of landfills and stuff are taken, but we would love to see, you know, government incentives where it's more affordable for people in rural communities, you know, farmers and things to capture that waste so it doesn't go into the atmosphere. And that's an additional revenue stream for them as well. Great, and, and thank you. Um, Tracy, do we have any other questions? No? Okay, um, for about three minutes left, um, for uh, you to each have 30 seconds 
to, to have any kind of summary wrap up statement. Um, I'm going to uh, start with uh, Allison, Kellen and, and uh, Dr. Patterson, Reagan, you get the last word, well, almost the last word, and then on, on of our panelists, and then we'll, we'll close out. Um, Allison, if you would. Thank you, and thank you again for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all and to hear questions and pushback on thoughts that we have as well. Um, to your point about communities, I know that our industry needs to be thinking about this in a way that's more equity focused. And I realized that um, if everybody listened to me, we'd be in a much different situation, <laughs> but <laughs> I am not shy. So I'm glad to keep, you know, making my voice heard within my industry. Uh, but I would also say kind of to a point I made initially, you know, we don't often either think about or have the luxury in our everyday lives to think about, you know, the trucks that are in our neighborhoods, the shuttles that operate in our airports and the types of vehicles that are moving around. So I would say for people who are, looking for different ways to engage their communities on behalf of those clean transportation choices, make your voice heard and where you spend your money and in the companies that you partner with and in the things you support in your local transit agencies. And I think hopefully enough Americans will continue to see the value in that to where we can all see a benefit, uh, particularly in communities that have been left behind for far too long. All right, all right, thank you. Uh, Kellen. Yeah, thank you. And I thank you again to having me here. I would say just a couple of closing thoughts to pick up some things we discussed. Um, I, I don't see really natural gas and electricity competing here so much. I think about really focusing where we need the most, um, you know, emissions reductions that we can move the quickest, right? I, I would say those use cases have shifted over time. We are talking about electric trucks and delivery vans in a way that we weren't five years ago. But there are so many hard parts of the transportation sector, particularly long haul trucking. We're not even touching on marine or aviation where we're going to need fungible liquid fuels, other fuels, gaseous fuels um, that electricity isn't really touching yet. Right. So I think there's going to be a role for all this going forward. We need to really think about how we can allocate it as quickly as possible and as cost effectively and as equitably as, as, as we can. Um, I would say just a, a couple of other points. And again, maybe to reiterate on the, the importance of, of engagement here. Um, please do get involved with, with your local uh, electric company if you're thinking about ways to transition to electric fuel and, and ways to make these programs more effective, right? Um, as you mentioned, Deidre, like setting up the intention of having a program is one thing, but implementing it is another. A lot of these programs have ongoing stakeholder groups, ongoing advisory committees. Please get engaged and help us make these more effective for everybody. And I'll, I'll, that'll be my last thought and, and ask for the group here. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Kellen. Dr. Patterson. Um, yes, and so in my introductory statements, I concluded with the need to affirm Black life. And I think that all of our work must be oriented toward a goal of reducing and eliminating harm and providing an increasing benefit. And to me, that must be the ultimate goal of the way in which we orient all of this work. And so centering equity, centering justice, and just briefly to also bring in, as Kellen said, there's additional aspects of this. Something we did not touch upon is how this infrastructure must also complement human powered vehicles, i.e. walking and biking um, and the infrastructure so that folks can get to public transit systems. And so all of this must be in this conversation when we talk about equitable access to transportation, as well as the health risks as well as the climate impacts. And so I just want us to keep in mind that when we talk specifically about Black communities, it must be to reduce and eliminate harm, provide and increase benefits and affirm Black life. All right, thank you all. And Tracy, you want to yeah. give us the, the wrap up for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists for your participation. Great conversation. And Tracy, I'll let you close it out. Sure enough, I want to, uh, to the audience, I want you to join me in thanking our panelists, Dr. Reagan Patterson, Allison Cunningham, Kellen Schefter, really great discussion. Uh, we started, and of course, our moderator, our own Dr. Deidre Sanders, we started off identifying three areas, uh, transportation, the highest uh, GHG emitting sector in our economy. We talked about climate change, which is a uh, threat, some would say existential, globally recognized, and then equity which is on everyone's tongue uh, these days uh, and throughout the Biden administration. So I think our panel did an excellent job of, of connecting the dots for the, through those three uh, issues. Two things I wanna leave you with. April, um, uh, 
our 44th national conference. Theme is connecting the dots. Uh, it will occur May 25th to 27th this year. It's virtual and registration for the conference will open on Monday, February 22nd. Final word is that we have a series coming to you in March next month. Um, popular title, What's Going On? So I'll leave you with that and say stay tuned for that uh, new series. Stay safe. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again.